Hi, everyone. Welcome to this week's Product School Talk. Um, this week, we have a very special guest with us, um, and he is, uh, we're just waiting a couple seconds. Um, if, uh, Vivek, if you want to turn on your camera and everything, we'll get. Hi. Hi. Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Welcome. How are you doing today? Good. How are you? Good. Um, guys, today we have Vivek um, Betty. He is coming to us from LearnVest, uh, product manager over there. Um, hi, Vivek. Can you talk a little bit about your background and how you got into product management? Sure. Um, hi, everybody. Vivek Betty. I'm at LearnVest. I'm the head of product there. Uh, before that, I was over at Goldman Sachs for about 13 years. Started off on the technology side, actually, then moved into product. Really focused on digital communications. Uh, was at a startup that was eventually acquired by Goldman Sachs, then had my own startup, um, and now running product for LearnVest, but we're also recently were acquired by Northwestern Mutual. So I have two personas. One is the head of product for LearnVest, but we're also, I'm also the head of products for consumer experience for Northwestern Mutual. I'm really excited to talk and share what I, we're up to. Awesome. Thanks so much. Um, and I know you have a presentation prepared, so I'll let you get that um, set up. And, um, and guys, if you want to type book in the comments, you'll get a free copy of the product book. So you can go ahead and do that now. Um, and then also following his presentation, we'll be taking questions after. So looks like you're all set. I'll let you take it from here. Great. Um, so thank you, everybody. Today, I wanted to really spend a little bit of some of my learnings over the last 15 plus years on just being obsessed with users as we think of product managers and really kind of building that gap between our products and our end users. Um, so fun fact, each year, a uh, Gartner study, there's been a few studies that have been done on this, but each year about 95% of the products that come to market end up failing, okay? Um, and you know, here's a few examples of it. If we think back to about seven to eight years ago, Microsoft Vesta, Vista was recently uh, um, released, right? And one of the downfalls of that product was really that shortfall that came from a user perspective. And it got bashed, right? It got bashed on with commercials, et cetera. So some, looking at that use case, some of it was really around compatibility issues, we all remember these days when we were trying to make applications connect together on Microsoft. Performance issues was always a challenge and competitive targeting. Everybody remembers that ad from Mac saying, I'm the Mac and I'm the Microsoft Vista and the comp competitive targeting that came to that. Now imagine in a world today, right? With Facebook, social, Twitter, how much more that could have been heightened. Uh, a second interesting analysis was Coca-Cola C2, I'm not sure if a lot are familiar with this, but Coca-Cola really tried to offer that drink with half the calories, right? And this was really in that fitness and health boom. And the product was really kind of stuck in limbo, if you think about it. There was quite a bit of marketing dollars that went into this product. But really, the consumers, what they wanted was that same great taste with zero calories, right? Why half? So again, this was scrapped off the market for six months, really not thinking about the user and asking the right questions and doing the right research. A third example is Weight Watchers. We all know that product well and, uh, and good. A lot of it came, Oprah had some endorsements towards it. Um, you know, at one point, Weight Watchers was a titan in the industry. Um, but what had happened was, you know, there's a lot of free apps there out there right now to monitor your wealth, monitor your health. And it really kind of got to a point where Weight Watchers really didn't adapt, right? And adapt to offering some of these services for free and looking at how you can track and goals. So a lot of that was a lot of the downfall of Weight Watchers as well. Now, products failing and not being customer focused is not something new. If we look back in time, there was the Ford Edsel that was released, only lasted about nine months in the market. Um, it was the time where everyone wanted a light car and we came in and Ford came in with this big bulky car, so it didn't last too long. The Sony Betamax, as anyone's old, as old as I am, they would remember that. This was really to compete with the VHS, but it was proprietary and Sony would only connect with their movies. So that was quickly long, short-lived in the market. 
Um, Pepsi had an amazing idea. Why don't we have a drink for the AM market, right? In the morning when you wake up to compete with coffee. Um, but as you can attest to, that isn't something that most of our consumers would look to do in early in the morning. Um, and even as early as our phone age, right? And the smartphone boom, ESPN thought, why not have a mobile ESPN phone that's really targeted with streaming ESPN content and data 24 seven. Again, not really long lived as well. Now the underlying problem is not obsessing about the consumer, right? When I think of products, it's all about the consumer in the end of the day and really how do we build our products around the consumer? Now our evolution a little bit at LearnVest and Northwestern Mutual, uh, you know, backstory LearnVest was, has been around for about five to six years, really geared at kind of fixing America's wallet, fintech through mobile and digital platforms. You know, you get introduced to a virtual planner that guides you through money management 101 and really gets your wallet in order. About two and a half years ago, they were acquired by Northwestern Mutual, the life insurance and investments company based out of Milwaukee, Wisconsin. So now we're also acting as a lot of their digital arm, right? Helping build out their mobile digital. They have 8,000 advisors across the states uh, that sell life insurance products uh, to folks like everyone on this call at coffee shops and how do we build the solutions for them. So two years ago, Northwestern had a limited digital experience. This is what our digital experiences look like, right? A lot of information overload, cluttered design. It was very difficult to understand. You actually needed the advisor with you to actually be able to comprehend the digital and web experience. Critical features were missing, you know, not prevalent even today in the life insurance industry, but we had no mobile presence. We had no pre-client experience. This was our brand and content website. Um, if the only digital experience you had is after you bought policy and you were a client, nothing while you were engaging with an advisor. Sharing tools lacked, right? A lot of communication happened in a uh, you know, non-compliant manner over Gmail and personal emails. There was no real good tool to exchange documents and exchange information, sensitive information between the client and the advisor. And servicing tools were an issue. I remember when I first joined at LearnVest, I've been a Northwestern Mutual policy holder for about two and a half, uh, sorry, four, four and a half years. And I tried to log on to my experience. I figured if I'm going to be running the web team, I should log on to my experience, right? And it was Friday night. Don't know why I was doing this on a Friday night. And I forgot my password. I clicked on the button that said, reset your password. And it said, call Monday morning, 8 a.m. Central, right? So we were in a state where... We didn't have reset your login and password. We didn't have the ability to pay bills online, change beneficiary forms. A lot of these self-service tools didn't exist as well. Well, I'm proud to say two years later, this is the lay of the land, right? We have mobile, we have a beautiful experience, it's clean. We went from about 150, uh, 80, uh, sorry, 185,000 of our 4 million clients using the digital experience. Now we're hovering around 1.5 million. So that's been rapid growth over the last two years and just people coming to the digital experience. And releases. Um, I remember when I first joined at Northwestern Mutual, I asked somebody who owns mobile. They said, I kind of do. And they raised their hand, but they waited on somebody across the room. So there wasn't really kind of clear ownership of who owns what. And that really caused us not to be in a uh, uh, ability to be agile, right? We had less than 100 releases in 2015. A little bit of time with us, we're hovering around 200 releases. Last year, we together, New York and Milwaukee, right? The product and digital teams, we had 1,405 releases. That's amazing to actually come that far within a year or two and just, you know, rapid expansion. Uh, quick check already, we're at about 500. If we keep going the pace that we're going, only six seven weeks into the year, we're going to break 4,000 releases. So, right, what we're doing is really working of getting this innovation startup culture together with a big company and the subject matter expertise that they bring and bring that all together. Now, how did we do it, right? Uh, we became agile. We were okay with failing. Gone are the days of who owns mobile. Now we know who owns mobile, unlike that meeting. We test, we fail, 
Um, we get feedback from our consumers and clients very, very early in the process. We're truly agile, right? We're really thinking about things in two week sprints and moving out forward. We've created pizza pie teams. If you haven't heard the concept is a team that shouldn't be bigger than a pizza pie box or two can serve. We have about 30 of them broken up in various parts of the experience, whether it's consumer, mobile investments, notifications. Now, interesting thing that we've done with these uh, teams is we've embedded business partners in them as well. So the composition of a pizza pie team is a product manager, a tech lead, four to six front end uh, to back end full stack developers. We'll have design resources in there, but we've embedded business partners as well. So this has been really uh, uh, astonishing for us as an experiment. Having the business partners in there on weekly reviews has really helped accelerate right the rate at what we can release it's really at that point the business is aware of exactly how we're thinking as well as our tech leads and product managers they're aware of what some of the business needs and challenges are about the user right as we have these 30 teams looking at their backlogs coming up with two week sprints making sure they're putting something out how are we thinking about the user in the end of the day that is what we're uh, this talk is about right the birth of the product specialist, okay? Um, so within my organization, we've created a team um, and I talked to a lot of my colleagues in the industry and this actually role still doesn't exist out there, which shocks me a bit, um, but it's a product specialist role. It's a team of about uh, 10 to 12 folks and their job is very much geared at going out and being the voice for those 30 pizza pie teams, right? Going out to, we, as I mentioned, we have 8,000 financial advisors through the U.S. that are the ones selling to clients, being that gateway into them. We have 4 million clients, but we also have 30 product managers in those pizza pie teams. Who is going to be the one that's giving and funneling that feedback back into them? Now, how does the product specialist role work? It's really interesting, right? People ask me, oh, doesn't that sound like product marketing? No, it's not product marketing. Product marketing is really geared at collateral, putting together that information that goes out to the masses. Um, the product managers on our team are really focused on the day in, day out, backlog, grooming, and management. This is that bridge in between, right? This is that team that has deep, deep product insight, but they're running focus groups. They're watching our users learn and shadow sessions. They're conducting feedback. We've created a few communities. The communities that are we've created are really focused around our clients and advisors. We have a community called the Dell Digital Experience Lab, where we've taken about um, a thousand of the 8,000 advisors that we have, and they get a sneak peek, they get a glimpse. They'll see black and white wires of things that we're working on before we're gonna release. We also have an inner circle group of about 4,000 clients of our 4 million that's worked through this group as well. So they're the ones that are getting gift cards and promotions and we're having sessions with them and really understanding what features, functionalities, clicks, buttons resonate with our clients before we release it with our product managers and our uh, teams. Um, here's some of the guiding principles and mantras of the product specialist. Put the users at the center of our products universe, right? It's easy to drift. We, a good example here of what we had was with the mobile. You know, the organization really wanted to be mobile friendly. The industry in general isn't mobile first when you think of life insurance. So there was many reasons for us to do mobile, right? Our CEO was asking for mobile. So we we're drifting away. We were actually doing mobile based off reasons that the organization wanted or industry wanted. But then we went back to our roots. What do the actual users want, right? And our product specialist brought some of our mobile product managers in front of our users. And it was really around budgets and net worth and understanding and creating that stickiness that brings us back, right? Now we built even a notification platform underneath this every Sunday night when I'm watching football, right? Or watching the Giants lose. Um, I, get a t I get a text notification that says, or a push notification that I'm up this month or I'm down this week, right? And it really drives me to go into the experience. A lot of this wouldn't have resonated if we easily drifted away from what, why we wanted to build mobile. It wasn't just about building it as an organizational principle, but it was really the product special that brought us close to our end users and really understanding what they wanted to build. Um, second mantra is stop hiding things from your users and get to them early. I've seen many times in uh, my career that people kind of fall victim of, to this. They wait and wait and wait, are nervous, 
to show our consumers and clients before something's a little bit baked. You know, we've been doing that with our accounts experience. One of the important um, aspects of the accounts experience is, is as an NM client or learn best client, you have the ability to link your external accounts, your Bank of America, your credit card, your mortgage, and it really kind of trends over time where your money's being spent and helps you define a budget. So as you can see here, we had some early wires, black and white, right? Sketchboard that turned into black and white experiences that eventually turned into beautiful color and beautiful um, graphs. Throughout each of those journeys, the product specialists were heavily involved with getting our product managers in front of the right users and advisors to make sure they resonate, right? Much feedback that we got was when you're going to show net worth, make sure you show the NM products in integrated into it. So it was very valuable to see that feedback directly to make sure that we're building it the right way. And this is where the product specialists help kind of build that bridge. Another one is just watch and listen, right? It's simple, but, and it sounds very rudimentary, but a lot of our product specialists are going out and doing workflow analysis, shadow sessions. They're visiting offices and actually watching and learning how people work. Um, in our investment space, you can see here some beautiful imagery, but you can see pie charts. And at the bottom right corner, it's hard to see, but you can see bar chart versus pie chart. So our younger advisors really wanna move to a buy chart, uh, bar chart view, but our more senior advisors advisors are interested in the pie chart view. And, you know, as little as that seems, we learn through our shadow sessions and just watching and listening how people work, that a lot of them have built that into their script. They've built it into their vernacular. They talk about this is a piece of your pie, or this is a slice of your pie as it comes to your finances. So us making drastic changes on the experience actually has a pretty negative impact on the way they tell their story. So a lot of time was spelt, spent with advisors learning and observing how they work. And yet just getting out there, getting out there, visiting them, showing them, learning from them, making it a habit. We have now instrumented for the 12 product specialists um, every other week, they spend a one hour call with it's required with an office, right? Yeah, we're breaking it up by the East Coast, the West Coast, Midwest, et cetera. There's nominated um, representatives for each region. Their job is to get on the phone with these advisors and their clients, listen to challenges they're having, help escalate them, and also bring in the product managers to show early wires and show demonstrations and deep insight of how we're thinking. And is it going the right way? Is that the way that we should be thinking about it or should we adjust course? Same token, I personally go out and visit our top 20 advisors twice a year. I make it a point to show them exactly what we're thinking about because we want to bring them early into the party, right? And think about how we're going to engage with them and they're going to help us define what we're going to build in the future. Take your team. I know this sounds interesting, but our product specialists are now spending quite a bit of time bringing developers, designers, um, product managers, business analysts, they really bring them out to show them how things really work. I'm a developer by nature, and I used to be victim to this too. And I never thought why we're building something from a product perspective actually matters because from a development or tech perspective, I can do it very easily in a different fashion. We've realized taking our team out there and really kind of showing them how things work has really resonated. Um, a fun story on this, uh, you can see on the screenshot here is we instrumented text-based um, notification when you log on. So you get a go you put in your phone number and you get a text code, right? You used to be able to answer security uh, questions such as your mother's maiden name, et cetera. When we release the text verification feature, our call volume in the home office and Northwestern Mutual spiked by 40% because there were a lot of people were wondering why Northwestern Mutual is asking text. Has the website been hacked, right? As our developers got in front of the use case and learned it more, they realize that now we have to introduce both and make sure it makes sense because certain clients aren't yet ready for text. Now about 40% of our users are using text code. So, you know, an interesting story when you're bringing the tech and design team to the forefront in front with the users, interesting how things can transform. Be transparent. 
if it's possible, tell the user why early, right? Um, one of the big themes and a big push in Northwestern Mutual right now is personalized content. I log in as, hi, Vivek Betty, and I see things that are pertinent to me, budgets, investments, while I might not be such more interested in insurance products, et cetera. So that's something that we can do right now, right? The technology team is working on it. We're thinking about a content management system that can expose APIs in a personal way. So we told our users directly, it's not available yet. We're working on it. Here's some ideas on how we're thinking on it, but we're going to keep you posted. It's okay to find alternatives. We found some other ways to actually surface some more generic content and have some personas. So we've won early on, but we're keeping them engaged. It's okay to be transparent early and make sure you're showing what's valuable and what's available. Um, and my final one, don't get married to your product. This happens so much and I instill it all the time. Unless you work for Twitter, Facebook, 95% of the time, you're probably not going to end up using the product you're building. <laughs> In many cases, it's very similar for my team, right? An example, we were building an online plan scenario, right? Um, one of the fundamentals of life insurance is you get a 40 page document at the Starbucks when you sign up for life insurance and then you file it away with your taxes because it's a 40 page static document, right? And as soon as you walk out of the Starbucks, your life is changing. So we're exploring an idea of an online plan that whether you log in on the 1st, the 10th, the 15th, it keeps track of your life and it keeps track of your accounts and goals and really tells you how you're trending towards them. Think a lot more proactive than reactive. And my product manager that was working on this got really obsessed and really interested and really focused on the way that she wanted to build it, right? Um, later realized that the product failed a few times and had its slip ups and eventually we could just did course it and now we have a beautiful experience that's been working for our clients and our advisors. Um, final, I brought it up, let it fail. It's okay if you have to put things out early, test and fail. We've been doing an applications tracking process where we've learned that can we take our paper forms and move them to a digital experience? And we found that, you know, moving a form from paper to digital isn't easy. You know, just people don't want to fill out forms, whether they're on paper or digital. So we learned that we now have to fit, test and iterate. And we failed a few times and we made an experience where you have a wizard with step one through five that gives you an idea of how things are progressing. So again, you know, obsessing about our users has not only helped us build amazing experiences, but it's really changed the way we think, work, and release. Now we spend most of our time doing a lot more show and tell before we bring to our developers, right? And using a lot of those communities through our product specialists to hit that home. We've been able to package our approach and repeat it. And I said over 1400 times, here's some quick examples. Northwesternmutual.com, the brand website, used to look like this. Now it looks like this, multiple iterations of talking to our users. Our client prospect website now has transformed. Our mobile app suite, which we didn't have, now we have. So a lot's transformed. Here's some quick numbers. We're at 1.5 million from 185,000 clients. We went from zero downloads. This is outdated. We're at about 100 downloads, 100,000 downloads. We have a lot of digital self-service, change beneficiary forms. You can pay your bills online now. We went from 0.7% of our clients, 4 million, remember, linking their external accounts. Now we have 48 billion linked and external assets. So we've really come a long way and we're just getting started. So I'm going to open it up to any questions that might be uh, on your mind about how we bridge that gap between the user and the product and especially using that product specialist team. Awesome. Thanks, awesome. Peter. Thanks, Peter. And uh, thanks, everyone, for watching. Um, I'm going to take questions off of the Facebook chat. So let's see who um, here. Um, our first question is from Lakshmi. Um, hi, Vivek. Thanks for sharing. Do you guys use A-B testing and, um, and fix it tell? Yes, we do use various tools for A-B testing. Um, and a lot of it is really geared at, we've used tools like Optimizely that are out there as well. A lot of it is really geared at experiences, right? Um, for some examples that we use are whether some copy will resonate, whether some feature sets. We usually start with various, some part of our population of our clients will see experience A versus B. And based off that, we'll do some testing to make sure. Um, and we won't just stop at one iteration. A lot of times that we've learned that we with A-B testing, the real answer is a combination of somewhere in the middle. So we'll actually do a few different rounds of it to make sure that 
it comes to a state that we're all happy with. And by the way, what I'll say is that for all the products we've released, once you release it, it's not over, <laughs> right? Um, so our teams are obsessing, especially those 30 pizza pie teams on how to iterate and even make it better. It's tax season right now. And one of that's a big season for us. So we spend a lot of time on a completely built website and mobile experience. How do we release some of that and do some A-B testing around what's messages resonate and what's the best way to provide certain documentations as an example? Awesome. Um, our next question is from Kenneth. Um, did you have any formalized structure or format in which you translated user feedback? And um, what were your learnings about how to best transmit information? Yeah, you know, what I'd say about that is I've learned over the years that formal plus informal is actually the right answer. Um, so yes, we have the Dell of the 1000 advisors. Yes, we have the inner circle of the 4000 clients, those communities. Now we have surveys that we use. We use general population tools as well to get feedback on, you know, things like usertesting.com, et cetera. So we use various mechanisms of kind of getting feedback that's a lot more structured, um, right? With surveys and um, checkpoints and um, pop-ups that are embedded in the experience experience and reach out programs and campaigns, even in office visits. So we have a slew of that. What I'll say is the informal actually proves very valuable as well. Um, that's why I've actually spent a lot of time on this product specialist team. They add a lot more to it. What they add is the fact that you're going out to the site and actually watching people work, right? You're looking at the data, but also looking at how they're using it, how they're clicking, what are their stories that they're telling, what's working, what's not working, what are their clients saying, what's the feedback that we're getting. So we've taken kind of that formal that the product managers and the uh, UX folks are looking at, as well as the informal with the product specialists. And we really kind of put that together. And that's where the acceleration really started to take off when you bring both of those worlds together. Awesome. Thanks. And our next question is, um, take one right here from Casey about UX. So how does your UX team work with the product specialist team? Can you talk about that? Yeah, good question. I mean, the UX team today spends quite a bit of time with both the product managers and the product specialists. With the product managers, it's really spending time uh, based off research, putting together the wires, putting together the um, concepts of what would resonate, doing the A-B testing, etc. Now, both of those personas, the product manager and the UX, then when they feel like they have something that is tangible, they spent a lot of time with our product specials going out and finding the right set of audience to go and get that feedback, right? Go and say, does this make sense? Does it resonate? So the UX team spends in many ways, spends quite a bit of time with the product managers building the right foundation. And then they use that product specialist voice to really be that voice, that megaphone that advocates it out. And then it's very agile because those three teams can work in two week sprints, right? Ironically, and they're, none of them are actually developers. That's the irony. So they spend quite a bit of time saying, let's readjust and let's get it back in front of the clients. Because the product specialists have a very reoccurring relationship with our advisors and clients, we can get things to them very fast with our UX team and iterate it, make changes and get it back to them because we have that proactive engagement that's going on. Awesome, yeah. Um, we have time for just one or two more questions. So um, I'm gonna take this one from Myra. Uh, what backgrounds do your product specialists usually come from? Like what qualities or skills do you look for? Yeah, that's a great question. Cause you know, we all know what backgrounds product managers come for. Product specialists are predominantly, most of them are ex product managers. Um, or subject matter experts, right? Um, so I'll tell you some of the things that I think that are very important in that role. You need to be deep in the product. A lot of their time is actually spent doing deep analysis, providing escalations, doing product demonstrations, showing the ins and outs, right? Um, another big aspect of it is being a great storyteller. This is the team that has to have the patience and also has to have the art to getting people on board behind your messaging. So um, ex-product managers, these are some of the skill sets, knowing the product well, being tech, not, uh, tech tech orientated as well as helpful and really understanding the industry. So quite a bit of their time as these are some of the skill sets, but ex product managers, some are even in the tech space, um, but mostly ex product managers are UX designers. Okay. Awesome. Um, well, thanks for that. Um, 
We're out of time, guys. Before we let you go, though, um, can you share your final advice for aspiring product managers? Yeah, my final advice for aspiring product managers is, you know, maybe I'm on the softer side of things, take the courses, go into product school, etc. But learn some of the informal traits as well. Storytelling, very important. Thinking about getting things, uh, getting people behind your message, very important. Some of those aspects, I can make myself available. I'm on LinkedIn, feel free to reach out. I'm always share, happy to share more tips and tricks from that perspective. Awesome. Great. Thank you again, Vivek. We appreciate you being with us today. And thanks everyone who joined. Um, if you want more information about us, you can go to productschool.com. Uh, we'll see everyone next week.